Hello, this is Ron Gerber, CEO of Angel Lead. I'm so excited to have Noam from Zadara, one of the leaders in storage as a service. There's all kinds of services out there. There's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. One of the new and fastest growing services is storage. We've seen Noam speak at several AngelBeat events, and it's always incredibly well received because end users from organizations across all vertical markets, uh, uh, medium, large, small, are all aware that the public cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and others, do offer some basic storage as a service capabilities. And what I've asked Noam to cover in this informative seminar is to talk about some of the unique capabilities that Zadora offers that makes it such a compelling solution. It also ties in more strategically with organizations looking to avoid capital expenditures avoid capital expenditures, and instead take advantage of operating expenditures when they are purchasing technology, which gives them greater flexibility and would much rather spend less money, but on a regular basis, than have big upfront expenses. Those are some of the topics we're going to cover. So any further ado, uh, Noam, all yours. Thanks so much, Ron. It's uh, great to be here, and I'm excited to discuss Storage as a Service, or STAS for short. And I'd like to start with a really basic question, which is, well, why should we care about STAS or Storage as a Service? And the top reason for that, the most obvious reason for that is because storage has exploded. It's growing faster and faster and faster, and it's becoming harder and harder to keep up with this growth. Uh, in fact, uh, it's becoming nearly impossible. And the way to be able to cope with that is to hand over that problem, that challenge, over to the people who are the experts in data management, which are the, the, the storage companies, and specifically the storage as a service companies, because rapid data growth requires flexibility, and that's where storage as a service comes in. And I want to actually drill down into this flexibility because to some, and probably to most, the thought of storage as a service conjures a, a new business model, a, a recurring monthly payment, a subscription. And that's part of it. And it's an important part of it, but it's not all of it. And I would like to cover why that is. So to do that, I drew a four quadrant diagram here. And what it has is it does have the business model on it. It has the traditional CapEx or capital expenditure at the bottom. That's the one-time upfront purchase of, of the storage. And at the top, it has the opposite approach, which is the OPEX, the operating expense. This is the flexible recurring model with the monthly, the monthly uh, payments. I also have a second dimension in here, and that has on the left side the traditional hardware. This is the kind of hardware that traditionally has been purchased for storage from the usual suspects or the incumbent vendors. And then the opposite of that is software-defined storage. And let's start at the, at, the, at the basics, at the beginning, which is how historically storage has been sold, which is as traditional hardware sold with a CapEx business model. You pay up front, you own the thing, you depreciate it over five years. And that used to work okay. Uh, because things didn't change so rapidly. But today, it's hard to predict one year out. It's impossible to predict three years out. And again, these things need to be depreciated typically over an even longer period of time. So this, this is therefore an old school way of doing things that used to work and no longer does. And it no longer does because it's rigid and inflexible. And that's where the OPEX model comes in. Let's, let's add that in. And what you see is that what you're trying to do here is teach an old dog new tricks. You're taking the same rigid and flexible hardware and you're putting a flexible business model around it, but the actual hardware won't change its spots. If it's the wrong thing, it's too small, it's too slow, it doesn't support the right protocols, then it's still the wrong thing no matter how flexible the business model is. So that's an incomplete solution. Similarly, if you leave the traditional hardware in place, take it back, you leave the traditional business model in place, but, but add software-defined storage, then you're fixing a different problem, and which is you now have 
a very flexible product. The software-defined storage is, yeah, can be reconfigured. It is uh, flexible. It is elastic. But if the business model is the old business model, then there's that freedom still isn't there because the product is flexible, but the purchase was made up front, and no changes can be made on the cost side of things. You've committed up front for what you're going to use. And I call that the light skiff that's tied down by the boat anchor. You have a very maneuverable software-defined storage that is anchored down by an inflexible business model. What that leaves, therefore, is the fourth quadrant, the top right, and that is nirvana because when you sell software-defined storage with an OpEx business model, now you have actual elasticity. You have flexible technology matched by a flexible business model. Now you can ebb and flow with the business. You can, you can zig when the business zigs. You can zag when the business zags and keep up with changes as they become necessary. This is why STAS is not just about the business model. It's, the business model is necessary but insufficient. It must also have a technical uh, technology advantage built into it as well. Uh, and I'll keep extending it because STAS is, is about more things yet. We talked, we talked about like, uh, the, the need to keep up with data growth. We talked about the need for uh, combining flexible technology uh, with, uh, with a flexible business model. There's at least one more piece in here. So obviously the technology has to be great. So it has to be fully featured technology that is a, is a candidate for replacing the traditional vendors. Uh, meaning that no one wants to go back in terms of capabilities in order to gain flexibility. Flexibility should come at no cost and require no compromises. So it's got to be fully featured. It's got to be fully flexible for the, all the reasons that I mentioned. And it's got to be fully managed. It's, it's storage as a service. Uh, in fact, it should be storage at your service because the point is to unburden you as the consumer of the storage. And if it's not fully managed, then you are still burdened with the everyday tasks of managing the storage. So STAS is about having the great technology with a great business model and flexibility and letting the vendor, the one who built it and knows best how to run it, run it. Why let the vendor abdicate their responsibility for running the storage in the best way possible, given that they know what that best way is? There's still more in, in terms of where STAS actually hits the mark. It needs to be universal. Why? Because universal means future proof. If the storage uh, supports all the possible protocols, then if there's a need for one of those protocols to be used, then the storage will support it and no new purchase and no new installation is required. Conversely, if it only supports a limited number of protocols and a need arises for a new protocol that's not supported, that requires a new purchase, and we go back to the same headaches. So good STAS will cover all data types, block and file and object. Enterprises uh, these days need all three of the above, and, and with object being the most rapidly growing one among those three. It should support all the protocols within those categories, so all the block protocols, all the file protocols, and all the object protocols. And it doesn't stop there. It should be location agnostic because almost everybody has some combination of on-premises resources, cloud resources, and sometimes uh, hybrid architectures that federate or combine those resources into a single architecture. A STAS solution should be able to live in any of these locations and in the name of flexibility, it should be able to change uh, its location as needed. So let, let's talk a little more about those locations. So you can think of it as two main kinds of locations, on-premises being in private data centers, uh, public clouds, right, the major public clouds, the hyperscalers, uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And there are all, there's also a third and growing uh, category, which is the co-location facilities. Uh, you hear names like Equinix and Sixterra, and Digital Realty Trust, these are companies whose businesses are to provide uh, data centers uh, and rent, rent space in those data centers uh, and provide power uh, to companies who don't want to manage their own on-premises locations. And that makes a lot of sense. If, if the storage administrator is 
unburdening him or herself with regard to managing the storage, why not also do similar things around real estate? Why deal with the physical plant when the uh, heating, ventilation, cooling, power, all of those things, fire suppression, when you can uh, outsource that to somebody whose only job is to maintain these buildings. So good staff will also uh, provide uh, all of these choices. And let me take a minute here to, to answer what may be a question on your minds, and that is, what about those hyperscale public cloud providers? Don't don't they provide storage as a service? And if they do, how how did, would this fit in? And the answer is yes, they provide storage as a service, but it's relatively rudimentary and it's only available inside those public clouds. And as I mentioned, almost every business out there and almost every uh, nonprofit or government organization out there has some combination and they would like to be able to meet all of their storage needs no matter where they exist, not just in the cloud, but, but anywhere. And would it be great if, if there were storage as a service that were available at all of those locations in an identical fashion? So there's no need to learn different ways of doing things in different places. So that also a good STAS service would be able to, uh, to do that. It would provide uh, the fully featured service, as I mentioned, that uh, provides uh, all of the capabilities and no other, none, no compromises compared to the traditional incumbent storage vendors, and yet is available in all these locations, including the hyperscale public clouds. So that was a little bit about what STAS is, to get, get the definition right. Now that we've gone through that, let's now start being more choosy and ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to do STAS right? I talked about fully featured, so let's put some more meat uh, on that bone. Uh, it should be a comprehensive feature set that is geared toward business continuity, data availability, performance, efficiency, and security. So that means it should include uh, things like data deduplication. It should provide uh, it, both hard drive and SSD options in order to ensure the customers have the most cost-effective solution available for each application. It should, of course, support encryption. Uh, it should support uh, high availability through clustering, through multi-zoning, uh, through remote replication. All of these things need to be supported, and they fall into that category of not giving anything up. The traditional storage solutions do support all of the above, but most cloud-type solutions uh, lack uh, quite, a, quite a few of these capabilities, and it does not make sense to adopt cloud but give up important capabilities. One should have the, all the flexibility and all the capability. That's what would make a good STAS solution. The next thing that should be done right if, if in, a, in a STAS uh, that is worth looking at or into is multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy can be a double-edged sword. Everybody gets the multi-tenancy provides efficiency of cost because there's sharing of common infrastructure. But if it's not done right, then the performance is going to be variable. The performance is going to be unpredictable. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as the noisy neighbor effect. So yes, we're all living in, a, in an apartment building, so it's more cost-effective than a house. But but if I live in a house, I don't have to worry about my neighbor practicing the trumpet. Well, there is a way to do multi-tenancy in a way that provides a single tenant experience. And that happens through segregation and isolation and dedication of resources. In other words, it is possible to provide resources uh, that are dedicated and yet they're elastic and on demand. It may, it may sound uh, like an oxymoron, but it's not. A properly architected staff can provide bare metal resources that are available on demand and can be grown and shrunk uh, as needed on the fly. And if you do that, the fact that you provide ded dedicated resources means that each tenant has a, his or her own environment that is not affected by anybody else's environment. No matter how hard one tenant drives the system, that tenant does not affect any other tenant and, and vice versa. Uh, and that's, uh, if done correctly, provides the best of both worlds. It provides a cost basis that is multi-tenant and an experience that is single-tenant. The next thing to look for in, 
properly implemented STAS is, is control. Uh, many STAS offerings out there and some of the cloud-based STAS offerings take sort of a one-size-fits-all approach in the name of simplicity. If the vendor makes a bunch of decisions on, on behalf of the customer, then, then the customer doesn't have to make those decisions and therefore they have a very simple experience. What's lost in the name of simplicity is control because if the, if the vendor is making those decisions, then the customer is not. And with storage, very rarely do two customers need the same thing. There are so many different combinations of performance, availability, and cost. It's a three-dimensional space. And if you give each customer their choice, they are most likely to pick a unique location within this three-dimensional space. Properly built STAS lets the customer on their own choose that optimization among performance, availability, and cost rather than make that determination for them and really offer something that looks like one size fits all, but it's actually a one size fits none. The last thing that this needs to do, and I mentioned simplicity, it, it really does need to be quick and easy to configure. So all that power and all that control uh, cannot force customers to have to be trained for weeks on the system. It should not require uh, much time to just to, to do it, regardless of training. So it should be a web-based GUI. Uh, it should be instant. In other words, from the moment that the request is made through the web GUI, uh, the, the result should be implemented in a matter of minutes. So it's got to be automated. It's got to be elastic. It's got to be straightforward. And by the way, also needs to be transparent. Right? There's, you, can't, you can't have control if you, don't, uh, if you don't see what's happening behind the scenes. And I mentioned before that the STAS, part of the definition of STAS is that it's fully managed. Well, I'll take it a notch up from there. It needs to be managed in a customer first manner. What do I mean by that is that this is not just about keeping the system up as a whole, uh, and not just about um, generic maintenance, uh, but it's got to be around making sure that each customer uh, is able to perform the things that they need to perform when they want or need to. Uh, and that's and that's really important. So so some ways that this can be achieved is through obviously making sure that there is uh, reactive support available at all times, 24-7, 365. But it also requires proactive management, right? If stitch in time saves nine, that means that uh, it's better to to forestall a customer issue by preventing it from happening in the first place. If it happens, you need to be able to respond to it quickly, but even better to uh, prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, second thing is the people who are responding to customer requests should be the same people who are doing this proactive management and maintenance. Why? Because they already know what's going on. So if a customer has a question or a request or an issue, A, they have access to the experts directly, and B, they don't have to explain to the experts the whole story. The experts are already on it. Uh, all they need to do is identify the issue that they're experiencing or, or provide the request uh, that they would like to implement, and then it'll get done. So when I look at customer first remote management, I look at who, who's responding to my request. Is it um, a, uh, a disembodied call center somewhere, or are these the actual people who are running the storage? I'd like to talk to those people, please. Um, Everything that is done maintenance-wise has got to be non-disruptive. Uh, why? Because this is, this is a service and it's measured based on its uptime. And it should be designed from the start to require zero planned downtime. There should be no operation that is routine that requires downtime. And if you're ever part of a STAS service and you get an email, hey, we're gonna go down um, uh, Saturday night between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., something's wrong, so that, that's a, that's a that's an incorrectly designed product. Nothing that is done in a course, the normal course of operation should require any downtime, even if it's replacing the hardware itself. All of this should be done live. And based on that, the SLA should guarantee the same. The SLA should uh, be strong. It should uh, provide very, very high availability. And, and regardless of the number of nines that it guarantees, it should provide 100% uh, credit mechanism. Why? Because all downtime is bad. Even if it's complies with a very strict SLA, there is no good time, good downtime. 
so old downtime should be subject to to credits uh, because that that's only fair. And I'm assuming that you've got all those capabilities in your structure because you've built in the appropriate redundancies, the appropriate failover mechanism. So if you do have a hardware problem and you've got to transfer or use another physical infrastructure to power customers' applications, that all be seamless and invisible to your customers. That's exactly right. In fact, I'll give you a dramatic example. Um, at some point in our development, we grew outgrew our racks in a given uh, data center. And at the time, the racks were uh, not adjacent to each other. There was a rack here and a rack there and a rack in another place and connected through via fiber to each other. Well, we, we ordered a cage uh, so that we could put all the racks together. And because of this cloud-based high availability architecture, we were able to move, physically move from three separate racks into a consolidated cage without taking down or interrupting the work of a single customer. This is, we're talking about, you know, many racks full, full of, of storage and moving, moving these uh, pieces of hardware one by one from, uh, from the old location to the new location in an, in an entirely live fashion. That's great. What a great story. It is. And, uh, we, we did sweat while doing it, uh, but the, the results spoke for itself. All right. So then, then the question comes along, well, okay, so that, that all sounds pretty good. Uh, and, but is it, is it hypothetical or is it practical? And the answer is it is practical. And let's, let's talk about three examples of somebody who's, uh, who's using this. Uh, so here's one example. Uh, hopefully you've, you've uh, you recognize the, the logo um, and here uh, here's the uh, key challenge was hybridity meaning uh, the, that combination that I mentioned before between public cloud and on-premises and the need to have a, a single solution right? a consistent solution for both of those and this is where uh, this is a very difficult problem. There are many solutions in the cloud, many solutions on-prem, but how about solutions that will do both equally well? So that's, that's where we came in uh, to help. And I love looking at these quotes So here on, on the left, uh, because this is from, from the customers themselves. So it's a total solution, didn't require any upfront investment, right? So this is the OpEx model, but also didn't require redesign of the IT systems. Why? Because it didn't take anything away. It provided all the capabilities that the legacy storage systems provide. So it's the best of all worlds. It's flexible, it's powerful, and, uh, and yet it's compatible. You know, that's a big so, thing we see at AngelBeat events when I talk to end users. They love to hear about new technologies. They want to make sure that the organizations are uh, if not bleeding edge, at least leading edge, but they also want to make sure that the implementation is seamless and easy and they don't have to rip and replace everything and learn a completely new solution, which is so difficult. That's why solutions and examples like this are so important. Some of the things we try and stress with all of our Angel Beef presenters and Zandera obviously does a great job in reflecting that strategy. Yeah, absolutely, exactly right. And uh, I'm, I, one reason why I love working with you is because of that really nice synergy. Uh, so here's another example, uh, Harvard University. And if you look at their uh, key challenges, um, privacy is important. Very, you know, it's important to many businesses that make, make sense here in terms of the privacy of uh, student records. Uh, OPEX pricing model. Uh, and and here's, here's a really neat thing that uh, we actually pioneered with them, with Harvard University. So if you look at the quote, we've been able to more actually, accurately match our data storage resources and costs to our needs. What do they mean by that? What they mean by that is, is in the very last bullet on the slide, the bottom left, they hibernate the storage every weekend. Why? They don't need it. There are no classes during the weekend. Classes are Monday through Friday. So they don't need access to the data. Why pay for it? This is possible with properly designed stand because customers pay based on the resources they consume. They're not going to use the storage. They don't, have, they don't need the controllers. 
and they don't need to pay for the controllers. This is, uh, th this is how powerful this model is and how closely aligned it is to, to customer needs. And, and again, this capability we implemented in concert uh, with Heartbeat. It's kind of a nice, a nice collaboration with our customer. And of course, it's available to all our customers. Last example uh, is, is Deloitte. Uh, <clears throat> Deloitte, uh, as you can imagine, stores, stores uh, customers' uh, private financial data. It's highly confidential. And in fact, they have many clients, uh, so many clients that often those clients are competitors of each other. So they're really concerned about uh, data leakage uh, among competitors. So what, um, what Deloitte needed was a way to segregate customer data, providing each customer a secure environment, and yet provide a good performance to all of them. And those things uh, have traditionally been very difficult. You can, this is the, the multi-tenancy conundrum that I mentioned earlier. If you chop up the storage and provide it to a lot of users, you get good, good cost, but you, would, you don't get as consistent performance. So with multi-tenancy done right, Deloitte is able to provide customers dedicated environments that are perfectly isolated from each other, both from a security standpoint and from a performance standpoint. So that means customers get uh, the pri data privacy that they need, the full control over their data, full control not only while the data lives, but also full control over the destruction of the data. Right? This is this is sensitive financial data, and when the customer deletes it, the customer wants it gone. So full control over the entire lifetime of the data and uh, high performance and dedicated performance on a per per customer basis. And you can see that in the quote, they. Uh, they wanted agility and flexibility, but they wanted to not just wanted, they were required to not sacrifice either performance or privacy. And this is this was the happy marriage between their requirements and, and our technology. So I appreciate the time uh, of anybody who listened through this uh, presentation. Uh, for more information, the, our website is here, zadara.com. It's all A's, all the vowels are A's, Z-A-D-A-R-A. And um, you can also email us directly at sales at zadara.com. In addition, you can always go to angelbeat.com, contact us, and I'll make sure your inquiries get passed along to Noam and his team. We think these type of solutions that are cloud-centric allow you to use new technology that's compatible with public cloud providers and existing infrastructure is critically important, that you've got the ability to better evaluate and compare OPEX versus CAPEX decisions on your technology choices in the future. These are all critical issues. We really appreciate everyone relying upon AngelBeat and our increasingly growing number of on-demand webinars where we want to be a trusted source of information on the latest technologies while many people are working from home as the coronavirus uh, affects many of us. But in a sense, this situation has, re has in, in many instances reinforced the importance of technology and we encourage people to look at this so you are spending your time on strategic issues and we look forward to seeing you on a live event in the very near future. Did you want to add anything else, Noam? Uh, no, just to, to validate uh, everything you've said, AngelBeat is a valuable source of information. That's why we are working with AngelBeat, because it's a trusted source of, of uh, information and, and uh, reveals, reveals the benefits of new and interesting uh, vendors. And I hope that you uh, vi visit uh, both of us and we would be delighted to have a conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. I look forward to meeting you at a live Angel Beat event in the future, and we're here to help. At this point, I'm going to end the webinar and thank all of you very much. Bye-bye now.